Good morning, everyone. Um, congratulations for making it on Friday morning. Um, appreciate it. I understand it was not the longest week, but it's always hard to get the ball rolling. Um, I'm Simon Belmar. Um, before I start talking about, um, did everybody here was here in the first class? Or no, no, yes. All right, so you were there. You correct me if I'm wrong. Um, most of uh, you guys uh, lecturing uh, will be online. Uh, you have a total of 36 hours of lecture. There is a tremendous variety. There's probably uh, 200 hours available for you uh, on topic from very traditional metallurgy, uh, welding, uh, how to make steel, to more maybe uh, general topic like what is engineering is a very famous uh, module that you can watch. Um, economics of uh, material selection is, is a module that also is very, very liked. Um, and there's a bunch of them. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to kind of decide what you want to do. And the uh, philosophy of the class is uh, to prepare you for, I guess, or I expose you to the life outside academia where, you know, we don't tell you you got to do a definitely this, 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 and this, and it, get, it leads to that, right? So we have expectation for you to um, follow the lectures, to learn, and um, to be accountable for the deadline. So we do have to put requirements, but it's different than another class. There's no exam. Um, and um, the first lecture that is going to be available online today goes through all the details and it's on slide. Unfortunately, the slides are not on Stellar. So I'll say very generally that when you follow a module, you have to prepare one page summary of what you've learned. And it doesn't have to be, <laughs> you know, it can, some people will throw in examples there that they really want to remember. Think of it as meeting minutes. You go somewhere and you want to make sure that you create a permanent learning and, and when, you, when you put that down, it's not to impress, it's not to repeat what we said, it's what have you learned, you know, what do you want to remember as part of, um, of that uh, learning effort. Um, the, um, the other requirements is even though most of it is online, you can do it at night, you can do it all in two days, <laughs> you know, it it's really becomes up to you. The other requirements is to be in class with us for six hours, okay? And that can be lecture or recitation. And the opportunity is really for September as far as the lecture it goes on almost every day. And that is uh, very clear on the, on the class lecture page. Um, like this week, we, we, uh, it's Friday, I'm doing the first lecture. Next week, there's somebody every day, and you can see some of the guest lecturer, and um, you know, uh, just f follow that and see what you're interested in. It doesn't the the six hours in class doesn't mean that you have to take that module, but we want to see you. We want you to ask questions, and, and that's really a very valuable. And it's also something students want. You know, you fill in the application and say, oh, I wish I could talk more to the faculty. And they come all, you know, and they get out, and, you know, nobody really talks to them. So we, we want to avoid all of that. It's very difficult to, uh, I guess, infuse experience in you guys, but um, it's part of the process. At least we want to expose you as much as possible, be as honest as possible with you on our life after academia. So um, six hours in class. So module summary, six hours in class. And then the, uh, the third one is you do have a term paper. Uh, it's you. And, and you actually have a submission date for your topic that is early. Our suggestion is that you front load your effort here because most other classes you're going to have midterm sometime in October, and then, you know, it goes on and on and on. I mean, you have the ability to be done here by mid-October, if, if you'd like. Uh, you do have until December, and we understand that, and we'll, we'll support that. Um, so the pay, final paper is due December 6th. That's not very... Um, 
you have a draft paper due November 1st, and um, your half-page proposal for your term paper where you, you should be getting some feedback there already is due on the 16th. So it's not a whole lot of time there, and I know that was a question you had. So I can um, expand a little bit on the general expectation there. We don't want to ask you to, uh, to make a lecture, you know, to cover a very broad topic. Um, we want you to dive deep enough so it does cover some of the engineering of what you're talking about. And the material does not matter. We've had people do glass, ceramic, and we had some people like our bones. I mean, everything goes in. Um, it has to be something that you want to learn about. Um, we, we have accepted in the past you kind of refurbishing a previous <laughs> work you've done over the summer, but I do recommend that you kind of start from scratch because we, the expectation is for you to go and dive and learn and, and report on what you found. And what I personally really like is when you tie your learning into some applications. We were talking about wood earlier. And you know, we can talk about the science of wood and you know, what generally people do with it. But you know, to some extent, in the context of this class, structural materials, it's nice if you say, well, wood is used a lot for this, and these are the reasons. It used to be used for this. It's no longer, and these are the reasons. So, so there's really kind of a, a, a more of a taught through process that speaks more to how these decisions are made. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all decisions. It's not just knowledge. And I think that's really what generally the student uh, like to hear from other students because there's some sharing here between you all. And um, we're always available. I get questions by email um, that I, I respond to. Um, if you send it to a lot of people, yeah, it's a little bit at your risk because when, when I see that, that you know, it's been emailed to the whole class, I just hope that somebody else is going to pick it up. So <laughs> if you're specific, I, I will respond. Um, so let's just now focus on uh, what I have to offer to you. Um, I've lectured in this class for seven years or eight years now. Uh, so you can go back into some of the early work I've done where we're more talking about uh, how you do the material selection in engineering for uh, aerospace. So this is a module of fitness for service that comes back sometimes. But the two pre-packaged one I'm showing here is a six hour on physical metallurgy deformation of polymer heat treatment and surface finishing. Um, it's really condensed, right? It's, it's, these are all topics that you could take a whole class on, but I've got a lot of positive feedback. And that's why I put all the notes. And when we have, we, I'm gonna have three recitations here at nine o'clock starting in two, three weeks. I welcome you to come and I'll say, I watch this, but you know, I'd like to know about this. Or, you know, you said this, but you know, what is going on here? Uh, there are some examples there. So uh, I did my undergrad in metallurgy, my master in polymers, and then my PhD here in contact mechanics. And only 100 pages, by the way. So try to meet me on that. I need to bring it back to our office today. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, as an engineering consultant, five years for a big company, and then I started a, a consulting company. I was just below 30 years old, or about 30 years old. So that was good. Um, the big topic that I've covered there is, was material selection for all sorts of applications. And when I started building that module here, structural materials in service, I really had that in mind. You know, how do you design differently for a bridge than an aircraft than a car? Um, and how does everything goes into that? And my, my big thing is always uh, a little bit processing, but also on the fitness for service aspect. So what are the material properties and what are the stresses? So try to make sure that you have um, adequate uh, strength design has been a big topic, but I also cover in one of those two modules uh, corrosion in details. That's something that I always get questioned. Oh, you said this and da 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 da. So because nobody 
wants to talk about it. <laughs> it's dirty, right? It's rusting, but it's uh, it's useful to understand. It's I struggled with it when I was a student, so I had to go and, and learn it when I worked, which is not what I, I mean. You take three classes in corrosion, then you get a call. Oh, I got a problem here. You know, come. <laughs> you have no idea what to do. You know, it's it's very very frustrating. Um, one of the projects was. Um, a steel beam on the stove drive tunnel, so there's a hundred thousand car going by a day. They can't shut it down, so you got to go there at two in the morning. And winter is coming up, and they want to know if it's going to break. You know, and you, you, there's no real, and you're the one man in the shop <laughs> to handle all the metallurgy issues. So I had to learn the hard way, and um, I'm, that's a little bit why I have been trying to improve those two modules to the point where. I'd said at some point, okay, I am going to talk about something else. Uh, I've been involved, I, I co-founded a startup company now uh, five years ago. Um, and 18 months ago, I started lecturing on that here. And I don't want to make it sound like it's a blog, right? Because, you know, I'm not like every morning, hey guys, you know, this is what's going on. <laughs> but there has been an evolution, okay, of course. and, and um, I'm, I'm very proud of how it's sequenced because I kind of go into um, how the ideas came out and how they were sorted and how you get off the ground and validate and find a customer. And, and, and um, the, we'll go through the outline, but the, the, the bottom line is there's nine hours right there. So you click that link, you get the notes and then you follow the videos. And it could be that the easiest thing is to download that because the, each of the nine lectures has a date. So you, on YouTube, you can find me very easily with those dates. Uh, my name is not there and it hasn't been a problem for me. I have other things to do than have people Google me and find all that right now. Uh, so it's all under kind of Professor Eager when, uh, when you're on, uh, on the YouTube pages. Okay. Questions on the class? Yes. So there are many modules. Yes. And in lecture, you're only going to cover some of them. Yep. But, but we have to do six of them, but there are some that won't even be covered in lecture, but there's six is online. Yes, exactly. Um, so for, for, for me, let's say you wanted to, do, like, let's say you happen to like that stuff and you want to do all of it. You got 24 hours there because you got two modules, six hour module that are there online. You have the nine that I've done before and we're doing three and this is one of them right now. So that makes for 24. So we're, and we're more about making sure that you learn. You know, if, if, you, if you miss one hour, that's just up to you, okay? That's, that's not, but we want you in class for six hours. That's, that's, the, that's the difference. And you can do a little more too. I, I came here a couple of times, you know. There was some graduate student, they knew Professor Eager was going to be here at 7.30. We'll, we'll just show up because um, and it, the only thing is, yeah, we do have to make it entertaining and uh, you know, making sure that you learn something. Okay. This one. I was working on it. So when I started the module on um, innovation via technology startup, um, Again, this is lecture 10 because I did six in February of 18. Then I did another three last this spring. And um, now we're doing essentially the last three. And then after that, yeah, it won't be a startup. I think it still is. But next semester, we'll talk about something else. Um, I guess the main idea is the same way I was talking to you all about corrosion. 
um, I had no idea when I got into a startup what I was going to be faced with. I had zero expectation. I thought we had discovered something really good and that it would be a quick shot to prove it and then somebody would be just so happy to grab it from us and you know do something practical with it. Um, and it's not the way it works. Um, so I'm showing here the topic for each of the hours so far, the nine hours. So the first one goes on how do you go from ideas to plans? And some of the basic reason for talking about that is there's a lot of uh, people that mention regularly, we could sit here, have a few drinks, and come up with really, really good ideas. You know, the, the new Google, the new Uber, and all that. And that's awesome. But then what? <laughs> you know, you're not doing it. You're expecting somebody else to do it? Okay, that's fine, right? But um, it's a big, big, big leap of faith to go from an idea to, I'm going to try to make it work. Uh, and you need a lot of help along the way. And if you're good, yeah, you, you just rolled into it for way, way, way longer than you ever thought. Um, now, there's one clarification I do want to make. This is not software. This is not, uh, there's a product A, and I'm going to make product B that's just better, but in the same market. So I'm talking what we call you know, hard tech, a little bit like there's the engine now on Cambridge, uh, on Mass Ave, that uh, you know, talks about stuff that it will take five, 10 years to develop. They know that from the beginning, right? Um, so because it's structural material, I, in our case, there's a lot of hardware, a lot of data analytics involved, and you cannot expect these things to happen really quick. Uh, and also one characteristic that's uh, happened generally when that's what you do, you do um, really a technology-based startup, is uh, you're going into a new market. Uh, and, and that has a lot of implication. Um, it does allow you, though, to have more time. And that's, that's something a little bit we're going to cover in terms of prototyping is you cannot make your product gradually to get traction from the customer and go towards adoption. <coughs> it's really, really the right way to do it. So in the old days, when I, maybe 15 years ago, they were talking about concurrent design and manufacturing. Um, so essentially, you know what kind of aircraft you're going to do and the pulling up like the manufacturing processes at the same time that you're designing exactly the shape type of situation. But here, we're a step further. <laughs> Say, I'm gonna have this available. And the customer is like, well, I have to think about how I'm gonna use that, right? And, and those two have to rise together. So the day that you really have a product, there's a big demand for it. Okay? Because people need years to actually go through the process of how I'm going to use this. It's a hard way to think, but yeah, people have budgets you know, in the industry. So um, the other thing is a lot of what I've been exposed to has been the type of startup sponsored by the National Science Foundation. Uh, it is an SBIR program, and there's a lot of detail in some previous lecture on, on how to get there. If you have an idea, there's money, uh, there's resources. Uh, but you'll, you'll end up putting a lot of your skin in the game. <laughs> there's, no doubt, there's no doubt on that. Um, so kind of continuing going through the outline, uh, how you find a customer, and how you start trying to get your technology off the ground. Um, the way that I phrase it very clearly is um, you haven't validated your customer until they wrote you a check. Very simple. So you think you did, all right? You, you know, you're getting a, you know, very proud, and you, oh, they want it. They told me they like it. You know, they told me that when I build it, they'll use it. PO or money. It's the only way you know. It's tough, it, but it, it, that's that's why you want to be very clear 
and you need guidance. I mean, there's a lot of resources here, especially at MIT. We have the Adventure Mentoring Service. At the beginning, they, they really are tactful. You know, they don't completely bring you down <laughs> what you think it is, but they'll point out these things as they see it, right? Because it, all that information is all in books, but it's like it, this day you wake up and you, know, you need to know where to go next, and that's really the value of having mentors and experienced people uh, working with you or that you go to uh, when, when regularly, when it's going well and when it's not going well. If you just go and it's not going well, that, it's going to be really tough. Um, so last, this, this past spring, about six months ago, I've talked about commercialization and a little bit on teams. I was really trying to start wrapping it up in terms of uh, the business aspect because in these nine hours, there's probably two thirds of it that is mostly on the development than the engineering. Uh, we will spend now a little more time on the engineering for these last three hours. Um, so we'll go two third, one third. Because <laughs> it, it's, just, it's just the way it is that, uh, uh, the, uh, the business aspect really, really matters a lot. Um, so I mentioned that it's hard to do, to go from the ideas to something that is commercial. And in terms of research here, because a lot of you are directly involved or at least know people involved in researches, it's great. You discover stuff. You um, find new knowledge, but um, it takes a long time. And this graph here is something that I really believe in. So if you're a graduate student um, and you're sponsored by the National Science Foundation, um, you're working on the discovery, you're on the very left side there. And before you get to an SBIR, it's about 10 years roughly. And there's another graph with years on this. And then there's the valley of debt. So these are the, you know, the five to 10 startup that tried and only one actually completely made it true. Um, it's a reality, it's tough, um, but it doesn't mean not to try it. Um, there's a lot to learn um, in the process. Um, and for me personally, I always felt that we have a lot of knowledge. I, and I know right now there's a big push um, in different new areas related to material uh, in engineering. The bioengineering group is, is growing uh, very well. Um, and there's a lot of people coming out of those programs that don't really have jobs, right? So the, the research <coughs> is ahead of the commercials application. It's, it, it's very, very common. The same way when I did my thesis, I was working on nanostructured material. They never made it through, and we're, we're 15 years after, but they were being researched. There's a lot of money spent, everybody getting excited to go to a conference just on that, okay? <laughs> Nothing else was being talked about. And it was the best guys in the material science community. So, there's always something that attracts the funding, the, uh, the faculty and the student, and the, the reality is it's going to take time before it's applied. So I do think unless you want to stay in academia, it's good that you come to other classes that are not about the hot thing of the day, because it's research a lot of times. Um, okay, so what are my objectives for the rest of today? Um, I think I've given you a little bit about me. Um, I do want to provide a little update on our startup because when you, the feedback I've gotten is um, a lot of questions. So people don't really question the theory of doing a startup. They all want to know more about our company, okay? so. We, we, so I respond to that, okay, and, and, and it's just, it, it's not because I like to talk about my stuff more than the theory. I, I want to give you a little bit of both, but all the questions I get, it's like, oh, you know, like, do you ask, like, how many people we have, right? So, 
back um, in the spring, we had only 10 employees. Now it's 16. And we're looking at the plans for next year. It was tough. It was tough, not just the recruiting, but the onboarding of new employees into our culture, into what we do. Really, really tough. So we're looking into next year, and one recommendation was to do the uh, process of setting goals first and then deciding how many resources you have. And th th that's why I have a lot of advisors and mentors because then I went to somebody else and said, well, isn't it true that you can only hire so many in terms of making sure that you onboard them and put them in a place that they can be productive? And yeah, we can't go more than 40, 50%. It's not going to happen. So, so we kind of reverse the problem. It's just like when you do a budget, you can do top down or bottom up. So we're kind of doing both. We know we, we're going to be between you know six or seven people, six seven new people joining the team, and then yeah, we can look at goals. But at least we have some idea on how crazy we can be with um, the amount of work we'll be able to do. Um, so. Very briefly, and I'm more able now to speak of it generally, is it is, our technology is a derivative of my PhD thesis. I graduated in 2006. Um, I mentioned about doing consulting. Um, at some point, there was this idea of use, making a tool uh, usable in the field for a tool that used to only be used in the lab. Um, and that was, Something a lot of people said, yeah, if you can make that happen, there is a general market for that. Um, so we went, eventually, we started working and spending money in 15, but we only got our first grant the following year in 2016. Um, and we managed to do the work in six months and get the sales before the end of the year on our first prototype. And that guaranteed continued funding. So, because we were able to, it was just 150K. Uh, we ended up spending probably 200K, got some work done with National Grid, uh, the utility in the fall, and then uh, put that, it was, <laughs> we, we took the picture in the field, put it into our application, and set it over the, almost the day of. It, it, was, it was so close. And it, it, that's what they needed. They wanted to make sure that we were driven by making it useful in the field. I mean, we said that's what we said we were going to do, right? So they wanted to see that, and we've learned tremendously. It influenced how we did. Our, every time, every year, we're like, oh, this was terrible, you know, in terms of how to do um, not just the work, but the data processing and the follow-ups. There's always something to be learned from cycles. We, we work on a yearly cycle right now as far as our big improvements. And we're lucky because our work is seasonal. Uh, you can't test a pipeline in the winter when it's going at full capacity. So it's, it's typically in the fall just before you really need it at full capacity. OK. Um, so 18, that was last year, we had 1.2 million in commercial sales. And that was enough then to get our first round of equity funding. So we've been bootstrapping until then on convertible notes and essentially uh, no, uh, loans um, as opposed to issuing equity into our company. And it has been uh, probably one of the best things I've done for the company because as of today, the investors are still about one third uh, of the equity. Uh, so we have a lot of ability to, uh, to drive the business uh, with the experience that we, that we have and the mentors and the, we have a board now and all these things. So uh, it's becoming uh, much better. I'm almost excited this, this fall, which is normally not the case. Uh, so what we do, pipelines um, are really important to the oil and gas industry, which a lot of people hate. But nobody, everybody gets also upset if, if service is interrupted. We need light here. We want heat. It was a little chilly outside. It only happens uh, with natural gas in the Northeast. If you have an electric car, it's fed by um, 
the electricity from the grid that in New England, more than two thirds of it is generated by natural gas. Um, and that natural gas does come from Texas or the Midwest. Um, it doesn't come from overseas. We'll be able to export it soon. Um, yes, this greenhouse effect is at a high level, but yeah, electrical cars don't solve that issue at all right now. Wind could, but then where do you put those wind turbines? Not easy. Um, I had an idea about that because there was something about making the sections of the wind turbine on site, but if there is some shore that people are willing to put some tower there, you just put your plant next to the ocean and then you just ship it, instead of shipping it by road, you just ship it by the ocean, you know. So there's ways to make things efficient. In Germany, they, um, they have these floating station that's got the wind turbine on them in the North Sea, because nobody wants to go there anyway, so nobody complain. Um, and it's too big to go and steal easily, I guess, I don't know. So. Um, there's ways, okay, and they will be discovered. But essentially what um, our investors say is for the next 20 years or so, we're still going to be relying on this. And um, a lot of that infrastructure is uh, post-World War II. So pipelines built in the 1940s, 50s, 60s. It's way, way, way past its design life. But it would be extremely expensive to replace. Um, it costs about 1% of the replacement cost to maintain the pipeline. And it, um, that means that you would need the, to decide to make a new one as opposed to keeping the existing. You need to know you're going to have demand for the next 120 years and no, nobody invests on 120 years, right? You invest on three, four, five year <laughs> returns. So there is no possibility to go and make a wholesale replacement of those pipelines. There are some small company that managed to make some replacement projects because they are their, their sales are driven, say, on the distribution side. And like, I cannot distribute if I don't have a pipeline, so I need a pipeline. And, and, and that's the same that you hear from some of those big companies. The, uh, um, the big project, Keystone, that's been talked about for five years is they can't, they can't do anything with the energy if they can't have that pipeline. So now all of a sudden things are very, very different. But generally there's competition, so there's different ways that you can move it. Um, and therefore, uh, it's, it's essentially a commodity. Um, and that makes it hard, a very old commodity that breaks sometimes, cause a fireball, leaks. Um, and um, it's a very, very challenging industry. So. Um, the government is putting pressure because Congress specifically hates pipelines. There's a, there's a pipeline safety hack that was put together two, three years ago. Um, and um, there's a lot of pressure right now on, hey, you guys are not doing your job. Um, there's some recommendation when there's an incident from NTSB that are issued and Department of Transportation has a lot on their plate and the oil and gas people are very powerful. So it's very hard to negotiate and arrive to term on new regulations. Um, there's some coming up, so that's, that's been our headwind <laughs> for <laughs> two, three years. It takes forever. There's a huge incident in 2010, so nine years ago, and the regulation is now expected to come in effect um, in October. We still can't read it. It's confidential, but it's all at this point just being held by the last administrative step. Um, so let's put the regulation aside. The biggest issue for the pipeline companies, because this is, they are just private entities. They have acquired a right to utilize this ground space. So to some extent, they do own the pipeline. But what they do is they are hired by an energy company to move the product from A to B. So there's a lot, for example, of gasoline that goes from Texas all the way to New York, a tremendous amount. And it's very, very efficient. It's 20 times cheaper than putting it in these big trucks. 
and carrying it across 20 times. It's five times better than rail, and there's no more <laughs> rail systems generally anyway, so that's, that's kind of out of the question. Uh, but again, it's this competition, and they have to control costs. They spend a lot on um, looking for defects on these old pipelines, uh, but there's, right now, the past two, three years, those failure rates are not going down. So increased spending, constant failure rate, so it's tough. It's tough, and uh, we believe we have a solution. Um, but before I get there, I want to explain a little bit how they, uh, they maintain those pipelines. So um, on the left there, you have um, what they call an inline inspection tool. Most pipelines are underground, but I didn't find a picture that shows it well there. So it's in a hole normally that they do that. They put that tool. They call it a smart pig, because in the old days, you would literally put a pig inside the pipeline and put a little uh, cleaning brush behind him and you know, hope that he makes it through the, the other side to clean. Um, so things have evolved <laughs> quite a bit since then. Um, so the smart pig are generally moved by the, the pressure and the flow of the product, whether it's gas or liquid, so they're able to go for you know, 25, 50 miles, I think the longest runs are 100 miles inside the pipeline. And they have magnetic sensor, ultrasonic sensor, looking at wall thickness, and some of them can look for cracks. Um, that information get given back to the operator with some margin of errors. The tools are not super, uh, plus or minus 20%. It's, um, at 80% confidence. So it's not weather forecasting, but it's, it's really not. Uh, overly accurate. So they do digs. Uh, so you see the guy on the right, uh, they dug a hole. If it's, uh, if it's here, well, right now in, in Massachusetts, there's no way to get the permits to dig holes. So we're just crossing our fingers that nothing's going to happen. But you know, in the state of New York or a lot of other states, they get permit. Rhode Island right now, we have Two teams right there that they stop the traffic, they dig the hole for the transmission pipeline, go, go and test it. Um, they do make more precise measurement. So now you have the ability to validate what you got from the inline inspection tool and verify some of the information. A lot of times, I don't know, maybe half the time, there is also a repair associated with that. So they don't just dig to verify, but they also take the opportunity to put up. There's two things. One is a sleeve, so two halves of pipe put on and welded. So uh, it's a permanent repair. There's also a composite that's been put sometimes to remediate dents. So a um, lot of effort going on there. There's more money spent on the right than on the left. Um, um, and um, these activities have happened repeatedly every three to seven years, and they always find something because the inline tools are getting better, the expectation are higher. Right now, there are new tools on the market, but people are worried about using them because they'll find more stuff, and now they'll have to deal with it. I mean, it's just it really is part of their the reality. If you get a report on the 50 mile line that's got a hundred. Um, you know, things to remediate, that's, that's just not practical if generally you've been doing 10. It, it's, and this, the, uh, the biggest challenge there is uh, that maybe biggest challenge is nobody wants to stop that pipeline. That's the biggest challenge. If you would be willing to go and discover something and be like, oh, it's okay. We'll just reduce pressure for it until we fix it in the next six months. It just doesn't work. Um, if we talk about gasoline, it's due at two o'clock <laughs> because the truck's gonna come to pick it up and bring it to, to the local station. If, if you stop the pipeline and you have for two months of delivery schedule already, it's, it's incredibly tough. So even a pressure reduction is a month 
of logistics, of rescheduling, and you know, not meeting contract requirements, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it really makes the industry very careful in terms of getting information. It's, it's, it's unfortunate. But um, I have seen firsthand that, yeah, when they go and get information, um, they tend to be induced into doing more and more work. Uh, and that shouldn't really be the case. You know, if you get more information, it means you can make better decision as opposed to just having to do 10 times more work. Um, so, so, but that mentality is kind of ongoing. And I, I believe that uh, when uh, the pipeline companies tell the government, you know, let me do a little bit the things that I think are the right way to do. Um, it's performance-based approach. Uh, I think you can justify that if your performance is improving. But I, I'm very honest with those guys when they, <laughs> they talk about this. Oh, we are over-regulated. OK, well, and, and we, we know they also do their own programs. They do their own fitness for service that are, is outside of regulation. Like when you build an aircraft, there's some very specific requirement on how to build it. But then the maintenance aspect is, is more of a you know, know-how type of approach. It's, it's, it's not as prescriptive. And that's the same with those pipelines. So there's some very specific design parameters. But for the repairs, there is um, engineering involved. And it's not, it's not like every crack that's a quarter inch needs to be fixed. It's, that's not how it works already. And they're not able to get that improvement. Um, we believe. And people will do agree. Uh, it's in large part because the um, technologies and the work is focused on looking for corrosion and cracks and anomalies in welds and dents. Those are the main things that we find on the pipeline. And when you find, we had an analogy yesterday, we call them wrinkles, you know, age, aging characteristic. The question is, which one matters? And the answer from our perspective is better knowledge of material properties. So when I mentioned those lines put in the 1950s, they have no record whatsoever. A lot of times, they just don't know what steel was bought to make the pipeline. And back in those days, especially when talk about fracture toughness, so the resistance to cracking and brittlement of welds and and things like that, there was the, uh, the standard for making the pipes was not requiring um, those characteristics to be tested. So some pipes are really good from different mills. Some pipes are really bad. People say like they behave like glass. Um, and if you can't tell the difference when you run your inline inspection and when you go in the ditch and figure out what the size difference is, you have to treat them all the same, and you're fixing a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be fixed, and then you have a lot of things that um, needs fixing that you don't get to because you don't know. So there'll be some small dents that will create a leak, and big dents that will be fine. You have no idea, partially because you don't know your material properties. You don't know resistance, fatigue, toughness, and, and what's going to happen to that pipe. It's the same for cracks. Um, so that's what we're offering. We're offering that material property information without service interruption. Um, the, um, the way the tools work, and that's going to kind of lead us a little bit on the uh, prototyping aspect, is um, instead of doing the tensile test or a hardness test, so if you look right here, this is just a hardness test, indentation hardness. We slide on the surface, and when we do this sliding, we look at the width of the groove that we generate. We have four different styluses, different shapes. They all go together. They all stay perpendicular to the surface. We measure the width, and that's all the iteration of the product that we had to do over the past three years. And we generate a stress cranker, so there's no need to cut the pipeline 
and um, send that sample to the lab. It's essentially as accurate. Um, there's another technology that we still haven't, we've made some money on. We've got some checks, but for lab testing. Um, it's going to measure the fracture toughness. Like you, when you do it in the lab, you have to pre-crack your specimen. So you load it in fatigue until you have a crack, and then you overload that crack. So it's very similar if you have a pipeline that is cracked, you want to know what it would take to split it open. And the history of those splits is it could go for a thousand feet of, of split of a pipeline uh, if the steel resistance to cracking is not sufficient. And again, that was not tested before. It wasn't part of the standard. So um, it's material property that we can collect by using, instead of using a little stylus here, we use a wedge. It peels off a small layer of steel. And what you see in red is because in the center of our wedge tool, we have an opening. It forces the material in triaxial tension and cause a crack. So when you look at that red surface on the top, it's a fracture surface that's elevated with respect to the cutting plane. And that's how we measure what's called a crack tip opening displacement before it fractured. Um, actually works very well. Um, and <laughs> you can probably, I mean, you only see the schematics here. You can imagine that there is a fair amount of uh, hardware, software, analytics, um, and reporting involved to, to make this happen, and then we need field procedures. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, departments. We used to have more departments than people. You know. uh, but I'm, I, I'm glad I spent the time to explain to you a little bit about our customers. With, with all those factors, you can't expect them to step into something completely new right away. And we found that this smaller company, more willing to give it a shot than the biggest guy. And that transition from early adopter to ma mainstream customer just take years. Um, so probably um, one of the best thing our sponsors emphasizes customer, customer, customer. Do you have a Show me your purchase order. <laughs> you had to include it in your submission. If you didn't have it, you know, they, they would believe it. Um, so the um, story of the prototyping is really what I want to focus on. I'm realizing I'm, I'm spending more time. Um, we got a report issued in 2018. So that is really three years after really working through iteration. That's when we got the full blessing. We did 50 blind tests, so very old pipe, 50 of them all in a warehouse that we didn't know the answer and we got it right. Uh, by far better than anybody else. Um, but kind of to put that in perspective, at that point we had already completed a probably a cumulative million dollar in sales. Um, so those were just smaller validation program, things with early adopter that they were willing to give it a shot. They did their own small series of blind tests. We did okay, we did better than the other guys, but um, this is the very first kind of publicly published literature that says this is great. So, you know, <laughs> it's really, really a gradual process. Uh, to date, we've done a 250 excavation site, that's a lot. We, so we, we do have a fair amount of data. Um, and that's our team. There's still a few people that were not there. And when we hired three more since we took two. <laughs> um, so the behind the scene, I mentioned about the investment. Um, there's been a lot of learning. And um, I'm fortunate to have two of the very key original co-founders still with me on the team. So one is CTO, the other is uh, vice president. And um, so we have a very strong understanding. Uh, I'm the guy who has to go outside the building a lot to figure out what's going on. And I think that I've been doing my job of seeing ahead, you know, what we would be able to do, what we may not be able to do. 
um, the biggest usefulness has been the concept of, from a hardware standpoint, minimum viable products. So I'm just showing it right here. Every stage, so you got 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. You see the tool here. You need a customer that's very, very motivated to give you the time, okay? But they did, okay? Because they saw we were able, we had these little, you know, plastic things showing, oh, we got the stylus and you slide on the surface, it's guided and it works easily. And see, it works even if you just put a few things together. So if you help us a little bit, we'll take it to the next step, right? So I think they only had that picture, the, um, the research council for pipeline, they gave us a first contract, okay? Um, now, we still needed to prove certain things before we got there, but, um, you know, the first digs, I was so worried about dust that, we, you know, the last minute we had a co-op put together an enclosure that was super heavy. Uh, but, you know, that was a $3,000 project as opposed to 15000 right? That's all we could afford. And then we realized we didn't even need it <laughs> to be airtight. So, you know, why would we spend so much money and then realize we didn't need it? Uh, so a lot of things learn over those years. Uh, the very first day, you know, took the whole day, but it did work. We realized we had some temperature effect on our hardware with the sun. I mean, we had really, you know, and we did a few things before. We did it in my backyard, okay? So we realized a few things that were gonna be tough before we got to the job site. I mean, on the job site, you got the crane, you got all this and people talking, it's loud and they're like, when are you going to be done there? Okay. <laughs> you got five people watching you, okay? So we, we had like two or three prep before we showed up there, and it still was tough. Um, as we grew, one of the biggest challenge was to train others to use the tool. Um, so we started hiring non-engineers, field technicians, and it was tough. We realized we didn't have the training program we needed, so we, we boosted that up. And now we're training other companies' personnel that we don't really know. They come to our facility for a couple of days and they need to get trained. So th this whole thing needs to happen step at a time. Uh, and it's tough, but it can be done. And we'll talk about it Monday morning. Uh, we'll close now, I'll try to see who's coming because I'll, uh, I'll get some uh, breakfast from, uh, from down there, the, the juice and stuff. I love doing that. Thank you very much.